Hello everyone, I'm Victor and in this video I want to talk about the SN1 reactions. So the SN1 reaction is the first order reaction in which the reaction rate only depends on the concentration of the substrate. Thus we can express the rate of the reaction as the rate equals to the rate constant multiplied by the concentration of our substrate here, which is typically going to be the alkyl halide. So for instance, let's look at this example over here. And while we do have the alkyl halide and the water molecule as our two reagents, the rate will only depend on the concentration of the third butyl bromide and not water. So only this molecule matters for our rate and not the other one. So let's look closer at the mechanism of this reaction. And the first step in the mechanism of this reaction is going to be the leaving group dissociation, which leads to the formation of the carbocation intermediate. And as we know, the band breaking is always an endothermic and unfavorable process. So why would this process happen and why wouldn't the bromine just attack back, reforming our starting material, bringing essentially this reaction to exactly where we started? Well, this is where the solvent plays an integral role. SN1 reactions are favored in polar protic solvents like water, alcohols, or acids. And as the leaving group, the bromine in this case, bears the negative charge, or I should say a partial negative charge over here, it attracts the partially positive charged hydrogens from our solvent. This creates sort of like a salvation layer around the bromine. So we can say that uh, our bromine is sort of like surrounded by those positively charged protons, which start tagging on our bromine. And as the bonds naturally vibrate, the pull from those hydrogens making this vibration stronger and stronger stronger and stronger with every single vibration, eventually just ripping the brom off the molecule completely. And as the Br- leaves the molecule, our polar protic solvent completely surrounds that, essentially encapsulating it, so we have bromine surrounded by those positively or partially positive protons, and that creates a salvation shell that stabilizes our Br- and that also prevents it from attacking our carbocation right back. As the carbocation is now surrounded by water molecules, the next step is going to be the nucleophilic attack from water onto our carbocation. And because we have waters everywhere around our carbocation, this attack is also going to be statistically favorable and super easy. This gives us the protonated species product. So here is my product, which is protonated, and I do have the positive charge on this oxygen. And as charged species are typically not particularly stable, we want to get rid of this positive charge and uh, make sure that our molecule is neutral and oxygen is neutral. And we can pull away this positive charge by deprotonating our molecule with a Br- or another H2O molecule, which is actually statistically more likely. And if we do so, what we're going to end up with, our final product, is going to be an uncharged alcohol in this case. So, from the energy diagram perspective, here is what we'd get if we plot this reaction onto the reaction coordinate energy diagram. This particular reaction has three steps. So, the first step, which is the living group dissociation, is right over here in our energy diagram, and that gives us our carbocation. The second step, which is going to be the nucleophilic attack, is right over here. And finally, the last step, which is going to be the proton transfer to give us the neutral product, well, that one is right there. And our rate determining step, in this case, the rate determining step is right over here, is the first step in this reaction that leads towards the formation of the carbocation. Let's look at one more example. Unlike in the last example, here we do not have a good leaving group right away. However, we are working in acidic conditions because this HBr over here is a very powerful acid. So let's do our acid-base chemistry first and see what happens. By protonating the OH, we actually do form a good leaving group, H2O. So in addition to six classic neutral leaving groups that we already know, which is chlorine, bromine, iodine, tosylate, 
mesylate and triflate, we now can add a few good positively charged living groups. And that's going to be water when it has two protons on that, or different protonated alcohols, where R is going to be some sort of a simple alkyl group like ethyl or propyl or methyl or whatever else you want, doesn't really matter. So now, when we have a good leaving group, we can proceed with the leaving group dissociation, making a carbocation, which is going to look like this. And as the carbocations are extremely electrophilic, aka they're electron-loving, they don't have a full octet around them, so they have an open shell, our carbocation will quickly react with anything available as a nucleophile around it. And the nucleophile is essentially going to be anything with an electron pair. If we reacted with water, that would bring us back to the previous structure, and that's not what we want to do. However, if we do the reaction with another nucleophile available, which is going to be Br-, that going to give us the final product in this reaction. And if I were to draw the reaction diagram for this molecule, I'm going to see this picture. And notice that in this case, we also have three steps in our process. The first step, which is a proton transfer right over here. The second step, the leaving group dissociation is right over here. And the final step, which is going to be our nucleophilic attack on the carbocation, that thing is right over there. And in this case, the rate determining step, the slowest step in our reaction, is actually the second step in our mechanism. So it's not the order of step that really matters here for SN1 reactions or any other reaction in general, but rather what happens in those steps. In both examples that we have already seen in this video today, the RDS, the rate determining step, was the formation of the carbocation. And as the general rule of thumb, you can remember that the rate determining step is typically going to be the step in which we are going to be forming the least stable intermediate in the reaction. So in any reaction that produces the carbocation, such as an SN1 reaction that we are talking about here today, or let's say an E1 reaction, reaction or electrophilic addition to alkenes or maybe um, electrophilic aromatic substitution or anything of that sort, the rate determining step will be the formation of the set carbocation. Now, what about the stereochemistry of the SN1 reactions? We know that the SN2 reactions, well, those guys proceed with the inversion of the stereochemistry. So how about the SN1 reactions? And up to this point in this video, I purposefully chose the examples where stereochemistry did not matter. But how about this example? In this example, the stereochemistry does matter. So let's go through this mechanism step by step. The first step in this reaction, like we would expect, is going to be the leaving group dissociation because we already have a very good leaving group in the form of the bromine. And as the leaving group dissociates from our molecule, we are going to form a carbocation. Well, carbocations, they are positively charged sp2 hybridized trigonal planar species in their geometry, which means that if I were to draw it, I can have a nucleophilic attack on the carbocation happening from two different sides. I can have the nucleophilic attack happening from the top side of the molecule, or I can have the nucleophilic attack happening from the bottom side of the molecule. And because of that, we're going to get two possible stereoisomers as a product. Thus, when it comes to SN1 reactions, they proceed with the racemization, aka the loss of stereochemistry and formation of both possible stereochemical outcomes. And here is something very important. Just like in the case of the SN2 reactions with multiple stereocenters, where the stereochemical change, the inversion of stereochemistry, only happens at the carbon where we do the reaction, in the SN1 reaction, the story is the same. The SN1 reactions will only racemize the atoms where the reaction occurs and everything else stays the same. So, for instance, let's look at this molecule over here. If I quickly draw the mechanism for the reaction, we'll get this. 
As a result, we get a pair of diastereomeric products because one of the chiral carbons that we had from the very beginning will stay unchanged. So here, if I look carefully at my molecule, I had the chiral carbon over here. And if I trace that particular chiral carbon throughout the rest of my molecule, I can see that I have never performed any kind of chemistry on that specific carbon, which means that the stereochemistry of that carbon gotta stay as is. However, I had the second carbon with stereochemistry from the beginning of my reaction. And if I trace the position of that carbon, I can see that once I have formed the carbocation, the reaction could happen from either one or the other face of the molecule, giving me two different stereocenters as the final result. And because one stereocenter stays as is and another stereocenter changes in the molecule, we are going to end up with a diastereomeric pair of the molecules as a result. Whew, that was a lot. So let's do a quick recap of everything that we have learned today. So first of all, S and 1 reactions, they are the first order reaction, they're unimolecular reactions that only depend on the concentration of our alkyl halide or substrate in general. These reactions form a carbocation for the intermediate. Because of the carbocation, we are going to lose any stereochemistry associated with any carbon that is being touched by the carbocation throughout the entire mechanism. So we are going to end up racemizing our molecule or losing the stereochemistry. Also, the SN1 reactions, they prefer the polar product solvents, and solvents here are extremely important. Without the solvent, we are not going to be able to form the carbocation. So this, however, is not all that we need to know about the SN1 reactions. As I've mentioned a moment ago, because we form carbocations as our intermediates, we can have various carbocationic rearrangements, such as hydride and alkyl shifts in our reactions. And in the next video, we're going to go over the basics of the carbocation rearrangements, when we can expect those and how to predict their outcomes. So make sure you subscribe, give this video a like, leave me your questions and comments below, and I'll see you in the next video.